one whereby we're, we're asking ourselves, how can we prepare students for a world that's increasingly unscripted, that we know that it's shaped by, you know, rapid technological change and social change and economic change, and that's obviously trickling down into the workplace. And this image by Eric Johansson, who's a digital uh, artist from Sweden, it's just one of my favorite images, but I regularly refer to it as a way of almost encapsulating the, the type of graduate um, we want uh, or we aspire to, to help develop or, or nurture or cultivate in DCU, but also perhaps the context within which they operate. So this is the idea that there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, but you also get this sense of purpose uh, in the individual in the picture. Um, there's a lot of uh, responsibility, um, uh, but also the freedom um, and this kind of tension that exists between having your freedom and your autonomy, but also the responsibility that comes with that to make your decisions. And the person is carving out their own uh, pathway uh, through life. And in many ways, that's our hope for our students, that we empower them so that they can um, navigate their own terrain. And I think one of the, the kind of metaphors or analogies I use a lot is around the difference between a map and a terrain. And we can provide people with maps, but the problem with maps is maps aren't dynamic and they have boundaries and they've got borders. Um, whereas, you know, as people go off and they navigate their own uh, geographies, their own typologies, you know, they're, they're better off having a compass because they'll go beyond the boundaries of our maps. Um, and their values, I think, in many ways and their competencies act as their compass. So that's uh, the kind of the context um, for DCU futures. So at a more specific level, obviously, um, we're at the, the start of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and that is defined by you know rapid technological change. So we've got five gener fifth generation networks, Internet of Things, obviously big data, automation, artificial intelligence. It's creating lots of opportunities, but also challenges. There's a lot of discussion around: is it going to cannibalize a huge number of of jobs that are currently uh, fulfilled by humans? Is it going to create more? Where is the the balance between that going to be? And um, but we do know it's going to impact all different sectors, including higher education. And I think, you know, particularly for universities, when we talk about students almost as a kind of the granular at an individual level, but it's absolutely fundamental that we talk about, you know, universities, institutions as communities and how we're going to respond to this fourth industrial revolution. So some of the big trends in higher education uh, that are being identified. So one of them clearly is, is the shift towards online learning, which has been accelerated by COVID. Um, and, you know, all of you are very much immersed in that. And then also, secondly, we have this kind of the diversification of organizations who are involved in higher education. And that goes from the likes of LinkedIn to FutureLearn to different consortia um, and, tech, other, and, and different tech companies as well. And that's really important because it's, it's probably the first time in the history of of higher education where we have this diversification or such a significant diversification of organizations who are um, involved in the in the domain uh, and then and then the third big trend is really around uh, customization and personalization so viewing students or students want an increasingly customized experience uh, a learning journey and how can we respond to that and i think certainly online offers a huge amount of uh, opportunities for that um, so therefore, in order for us to ensure that our graduates are future capable, um, and that's the term I use, I, I no longer use the, 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 the term future proof. Um, I used when I started the job three or four months ago, I, I love the kind of the seductive nature of future proofing, but now I've, I've, I've moved away from that. I'm very much around future capable. So we need to ensure our institutions, our infrastructure, um, from a tech side as well, are future capable. Um, and that fundamentally our values, our compass, I suppose, is this idea of being purposely different and consistently excellent. Um, because I think as environments change so rapidly, the, the, the constant that we can refer to is our, our values. What do we put value on? And they should be our, our compass, our guide as we navigate that terrain. So when we talk about DCU Futures, DCU Futures is an initiative that involves the introduction of 10 new undergraduate programs into DCU. So nine of these are starting this coming September. We're really excited about it. It's, we've never before had such a large number of undergraduate programs coming on stream in one academic year. And on top of that, 
you know, these are fundamentally different way of delivering um, uh, higher education or undergraduate education. So it, I suppose that it's combined around the idea of, you know, what students will learn, but then crucially how they will learn. And obviously the online kicks in very much there. And as well as that, then the third component of it, which is my job, is all around the, the area of transversal skills. Um, and so just for clarification, transversal skills are skills which do not reside in any particular uh, discipline or domain, but can be applied across all domains. Um, so they're obviously related to 21st century skills and they're related to, to transferable skills as well. But the, the, uh, the terminology is, is trans, transversal skills at this particular point in time. So as regards uh, the first uh, point, so what students will learn. So what we're interested in really is, um, sorry, is this idea of you know what domains, what subjects, what disciplines are there opportunities in? What disciplines is there a need for people to develop expertise in? And one of the key values uh, of DCU Futures is the idea of hybridity and interdisciplinarity. So we know, for example, that you know creativity and innovation emerges at the nexus, at the point of intersection between diverse knowledge sets, and that's very much reflected in the programs that we are we are developing. So these are programs that range from global challenges, which is a combination of social sciences and engineering, uh, to psychology and maths, to physics and data analytics, chemistry and artificial intelligence, all fascinating areas in their own right. But also, as I said, this, this kind of hybridity, the recognition um, that you know, there's so, many, so much potential that exists at the interface between these different disciplines is the rationale for, for what we're doing. And as well as that, then we have, and we, I can talk a lot more about them, obviously, but this is a very quick uh, tour of them. And then a key thing really is around the why, and I suppose relating to online, this is really important. So, um, or sorry, the how, Mark, so the how our students are learning. So first of all, there's a, there's a real shift away from kind of the sage and the stage model. The idea that there's someone who's just kind of disseminating information to a relatively passive uh, audience and through traditional education. And it's not at all the case that people aren't already doing really fantastic things in the area of, you know, uh, experimental or different types of uh, methodologies and pedagogies. But this is about, I suppose, formally trying to embed this. So number one, a huge focus on challenge based learning. So getting students, giving them the opportunity to get their hands dirty, to really apply their knowledge in a meaningful way. Uh, secondly, engagement with industry. So for the first time, industry is going to be heavily involved in the in the co-creations, that's the design of the modules and the programs, the delivery of the modules, the assessment evaluation of the modules. That's a really key thing. So we have a number of major industry partners who are involved in DC Futures. Then this immersive learning experience, where once again, we're trying to ensure that there's interaction between students across different disciplines so they can um, stir that uh, diversity and come up with innovative outputs and then online learning and what's funny about online learning when we put in the application for DCU futures we thought we were being quite radical in saying that 15 percent of students learning uh, would be online and that was submitted about two weeks before COVID happened and nowadays you know, a year and a bit later we realize okay 15 percent that was quite modest perhaps uh, and then finally virtual labs so a lot of the courses are around the hard sciences so virtual labs offer students in those disciplines lots of opportunities for example if you're a chemist and there's absolutely no way you would be allowed to mix certain chemicals in the lab because it would blow the place up now you're going to have the opportunity to to dabble to experiment in a safe way in, in this environment that again feeds into the, the online side of things and then the third big component really is around the transversal skills where uh, i'm located and the transversal skills is uh, it's responding number one to the fact that you know graduates are going to be more career mobile than ever before they're going to change their careers not their jobs than ever before and they're probably going to work longer as well this idea of interdisciplinarity so the importance of being able to apply your skills across disciplines and domains and um, and also the idea that you know the narrative around the potential threat of automation and artificial intelligence um, you know, we can certainly discuss that in relation to these transversal skills are fundamentally human skills. They are skills that uh, at this point in time and for this foreseeable future cannot be replicated uh, by automation and artificial intelligence. And then there's a, therefore there are a way of differentiating 
uh, humans from what technology can do. So um, very quickly then in, in terms of exactly what those skills might be. So we're still in the process of shortlisting our skills, but they're based upon a, a framework of four pillars. So we've got ways of thinking, we have ways of working, we have tools for working and tools for thriving. Um, so thinking around creativity, ethics, sustainability, critical thinking, uh, ways of working could be personal or group leadership, um, uh, communication, compelling communication, teamwork, entrepreneurial spirit, then tools for working around digital literacy, data anal uh, uh, analytics, um, project management, multilingualism, for example, all students will have the opportunity to uh, take um, we have seven different languages on offer. And then finally, the, the tools for thriving is arguably the most challenging, but perhaps the most important around personal agility, emotional intelligence, intercultural competence, essentially developing these type of um, personal attributes that will allow people to navigate, allow our students to navigate the uncertainty of this unscripted uh, world. So we're in the process of finalizing um, those transversal skills, and then we're going to figure out how to actually integrate them into the uh, the learning experience into the program of, of all the students. And so fundamentally, our aim is to ensure that no matter what students study, that they exit with this set of highly valuable, highly relevant transversal skills, and that they can evidence these transversal skills. And so fundamentally, the why of this is to ensure that students have a higher level of personal agency, and uh, that they have this capability, and they have the competence, and they have the confidence, and they have the conviction, the passion, to pursue uh, their career um, in a way that they have reason to value. So if we go back to that initial image from Eric Johansson that you know, each student is carving out their own pathway. Um, we believe through DCU Futures, through the in introduction of these innovative programs by embracing challenge-based learning, by embracing the affordances of online learning and the importance of transversal skills, that essentially is our approach to uh, fostering our students personal agency for the 21st century. So I will stop talking there. Thanks very much, Karen. Um, I'm sure there would be a, a raft of questions. I know I have questions around uh, the challenges of how you measure transversal skills, but when I on the time, what I think you touched on um, the importance of the how um, to go alongside with the what, and perhaps linked to those two questions or um, domains, we're also interested in the when, and that's where the online comes in as well. So I'm going to suggest that we just push on with our panel to be talking about the what, the how, and the when in an online context. But I think the DCU Futures um, example or case helps to anchor this into something very real, at least in DCU. And I hope people appreciate it, getting an insight into something that's quite a ongoing uh, and still relatively new initiative. So George, before I come to you, um, I'm coming to you first because you published a book pre-COVID about the student online learning experience. And um, I was particularly interested in that book because um, and at risk of a little bit of self-publicity, one of the most interesting research projects I've ever done in my career is where we used video diaries with first-time online learners. I've just put a link to one of the many publications that was um, produced on, based on around that study. And we just learned so much from listening to learners in their own voice um, on a weekly basis. In fact, that intervention itself became very powerful pedagogically. So George, what did we know about online learners before we hit the crisis and moved to emergency remote teaching and perhaps online learning progressively? Uh, thanks so much, Mark, uh, for that. And, um, and you're absolutely right. The, the book that I was working on, which is uh, there's a copy learning online, the student experience, and so your library probably has a copy. Um, that book, this book, is essentially motivated by the idea of listening, of listening to students' stories, listening to what they have to tell us and what they can teach us. Um, it was motivated by a different book, um, one called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Um, written by, um, by Dr. Sachs, 
who um, who try to make sense of um, of certain um, neural disorders. Um, so I was reading that book and thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting if um, I sort of try to understand online learning from solely from the idea of what do students have to tell us. And even though most of us have spent you know, many months teaching and learning remotely, there's sort of a long history to the practice and scholarship of online teaching and learning, right? And, and researchers have a pretty good idea of what works and what doesn't in this approach to education. So for example, um, we know, for instance, that people choose or used to choose online study for a wide variety of reasons. They may be that they live far away from educational institutions, perhaps are unwilling to leave their job and families behind to pursue further study. And so they appreciate the flexibility uh, that online learning offers them. And, and even for sort of what we usually call traditional students, it may be that you know, an online uh, course, an online undergraduate course fits their needs at a particular semester, right? And allows them to complete their degree requirements, even though they don't necessarily take the whole of their program online. And we also know a number of challenges that students might face uh, in online contexts. For instance, much of the literature focuses on feelings of isolation and loneliness um, and high attrition rates uh, and tries to find ways to address those challenges. And even though we know that not everyone faces those challenges, some students are particularly good at managing their, um, their learning and being self-directed. Um, others need various kinds of supports to succeed. Uh, and what we figured out over time is that these supports are generally referred to as sort of good designs, right? So such good designs uh, might recognize that online courses should be more than placeholders for just information. And towards this end, online efforts that aim to support all learners to succeed might include various kinds of interactions, right? They might include interactions between uh, peers, interactions between peers, between uh, students and faculty, um, with the aim being towards creating sort of a social and vibrant uh, learning community. And increasingly, such interactions, uh, they may nowadays may encompass interactions between humans and software, right? So the kinds of things that um, that Karen was talking about beforehand. Um, such, for example, a case of a piece of software that provides automated feedback and assessment and so on. Nonetheless, we know that the presence of a visible, sort of active, empathetic, responsive instructor and sort of teaching team is critical to student success. Uh, much of this has been reaffirmed during the pandemic, um, but maybe I'll pause there for a moment before I talk sort of what we might have learned during the pandemic um, and turning it back over to you, Mark. Well, thanks, George, and I appreciate you uh, giving us bite-sized chunks of your experience in this area. I think, folks, the, the value of just beginning on this note is, is just too easy to forget that online distance education has a very long history. And um, initially, I think, for understandable reasons in the um, move to emergency remote teaching, some of that got a little lost. Sharon, I'm going to come to you rather than take questions straight from the other uh, participants at this point, because you've kind of lived this journey. What I just described, um, I saw you sort of nodding a little bit there whether that resonates, the extent with which we've peeled away the layers over the last 18 months to now have a very different and, and hopefully better and deeper understanding. So very interested to hear your uh, experience and as well as the project that you've mentioned or projects that you've already um, introduced at the start. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, I'm, I'm gonna try and keep um, nicely focused and, and um, you know, I appreciate that uh, George has also um, tried to do the same because I know that once you get me started, I can keep on talking forever about this sort of thing. I think it's interesting that, um, you know, the, um, um, the, the, there was a survey done um, back in November of 2019, um, uh, which, which uh, surveyed staff and students across higher education in Ireland. And um, certainly my project, we joked a little bit about it, that in terms of the student digital experience, 
uh, we'd be doing a great job if we could just get staff to use the VLE consistently. Um, that would actually improve the, the learning experience for the vast majority of students. Um, and, you know, in some ways that has changed very little. Um, but just to, to, to give a little bit of context, I suppose, um, as part of the project that I lead, we made a decision around this time last year, actually, to, to really partner with students. And we recruited a number of student associate interns across the seven universities to work with us so that they would be able to really um, give their opinions and ask the questions and challenge our assumptions, I think it would be fair to say. So one of the things that we did most recently was back in April, realizing that a lot of decisions were going to be made over the next couple of months about what teaching and learning would look like in September. We said, look, we, we, have, to, we have to go out and ask, ask the students, what do they want? And really bring in their vision for the future. So we ran a campaign, a student campaign, um, which was your education, your voice, your vision, where we asked students to think about their ideal situation for, for learning in a post-pandemic environment. Um, it was run primarily on social media, so on, um, on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok. Um, but there was an option for people to, to go off any of those platforms and, and respond to a survey on our own website as well. Um, so I'd like to just share a little bit of the responses that came out of that, because I think it's really important that we consider not just the answers that they gave, but what might be going on behind those answers. And it's difficult because, you know, all of our questions, in fact, there were, there were two possible answers. There were simple polls because that's what you do on social media. And we wanted a quick response. So I'd like to point out, first of all, that in some cases we had up to almost 5,000 responses to a poll, to a single poll. In other cases, we had much less. So any single student may have seen one poll or two poll questions, but nobody answered everything. So the first thing um, that I'd like to mention is we asked students in an ideal world, what does your learning in a lecture look like? And given you know, what we hear about in the media and a lot of the reports um, and anecdotes that come out, we, we heard that students had a rotten time, I think is what our, our minister said. Um, but actually, when we look at what the students responded, they were given two choices in person on campus or online, either live or recorded. And you might expect that a huge amount would, would vote for the in person on campus, but actually the split was much closer than we anticipated. We had 56% of people said they wanted their learning in lectures to be in person. And 44% said online, either live or recorded. And I think that that is actually, while it's surprising, um, at the same time, I'm not sure how surprising it is, given that we've heard an awful lot about students wanting the recording of lectures to continue. Um, and I, I think that it, it indicates that while there is a huge desire to get back on campus, students also want a lot of their learning to happen online at the same time. Um, just following from that, um, a couple of other questions that we asked were about, did they want everything online or everything on campus? And in that case, people voted for the on-campus version. So students definitely want to be back on campus. But when we suggested whether they wanted lectures on campus and tutorials online, or tutorials on campus and lectures online, overwhelmingly, they said they would prefer to have tutorials face-to-face -face in person and lectures online, and that was 62%. So, you know, I think that there's a lot of things that we need to explore around this, and I don't think that simply recording lectures is necessarily the answer. But I think that there are certain nuances here that we need to understand a little bit more. Another one, which I think um, is very interesting was we asked in an ideal world, how much time will you spend on campus? And the two options were one to three days each week or four to five days each week. And I did a little experiment on this. Um, there was the, the EdTech conference happened recently, Mark, as you know, and I put up a little poll to see what, what staff would think about that. And I know myself, I have no desire to hurry back on campus or back into the office. And I think a lot of staff feel that way. 
And you know what, students feel that way too, because 76% um, of students said that they were willing to be one to three days on campus. And only, um, well, less than 25% said four to five days on campus. So, you know, students are realizing that there is this flexibility um, which can be offered to them. You know, in the past we said, no, it's not possible. Um, but now actually it is possible. And, and students would like to avail of the opportunity to, to work from home or other places as well. Um, in terms of interactions, we asked them about interacting and engaging with other students. And we asked them about interacting and engaging with staff. And in this case, overwhelmingly, in both cases, over 80% said that they would prefer to that to happen face to face. Um, and in both cases, between 15 and 18% said online. We were kind of surprised at that because we felt that, um, first of all, a lot of students really enjoyed, say, being able to avail of um, online office hours um, without having to trek around a campus trying to find um, a lecturer's um, office, which may be in some remote part of the campus somewhere. Um, but also a lot of students like to be able to think that they can email their lecturers, but actually in the survey that we did, they, they said that they preferred to have their interactions and engagements face-to-face -face with staff. Um, two more that I'll just tell you about, which is around assessment. We asked them in an ideal world, where will you study for assessments? And this was interesting because again, we had an almost even split, 58% of students said that they would prefer to study at home um, and 42% said they would prefer to study on campus. Now, what this tells me is that we need to have lots of spaces on campus for students to, to study, to complete assignments, but also to attend online lectures. Because if we're asking students to come on, not, uh, come on campus for part of the day to engage with tutorials or small um, um, teaching sessions, we and, but then to expect them also to join online, um, we need spaces for them to be able to do that. And as some of our student interns said, those spaces need to be places where you can talk, where you can interact, where you can you know, set up study groups. Um, maybe a, a, the quiet space in the library isn't the right place for that. So I think we're going to need a variety of spaces for the students. And lastly, and then I will stop talking, I promise, um, we asked them about assessment and what they thought about assessment, because I think that has been the biggest change and the biggest challenge over the last year for the universities is how to move away from the formal sit down exams. And that was just a massive challenge for every single university. Um, our students replied, more than 80% said that they would prefer to have continuous or open book exams and less than 20% talked about mostly end of term exams. Um, and to be honest, if we can take one thing out of this pandemic, can we please move away from the large exam halls? Um, that would be my biggest wish. And if we could support that, I think um, it would really be a, a huge um, success and gain and a move to more authentic assessment as well. Okay, I'll stop talking there and uh, you feel free to come back to me at any stage. Yeah, and that was fascinating. Um, and I think we could probably have you keep talking for quite a while. Uh, your point about uh, exams, I, I reached for my pen because I don't know where anywhere in my work life I ever have to sit down and write for three hours with a pen. I actually don't think I could. I, I've lost, you know, my art, my wrist would be very sore. Terence, I, I couldn't but move to you after what Sharon has told us. Um, to bring a, a single student perspective in, but you are representing the DCU Student Union now, and there are really serious implications that Sharon, I think, has um, presented to us for institutions. So the floor is yours for whatever you want to respond to or any comments you wish to share with us. Yeah, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Sharon, for um, pulling out those stats. I can personally relate to a lot of them having interviewed hundreds of students over the last few months to kind of gain opinions on what the what the student union needed to achieve in the next year or in the next few years. Um, and yet the, the first point recorded lectures was the resounding yes in the change the way 
it, it was the game changer for all students across the university. Because not only was it um, not not only did it, like not only was it suitable um, for revision purposes, isn't like when you were going back to study for whether it's an exam or whether you're revising to, to do an assignment, it, it was much more effective study rather than going through slides or looking through notes that you took in a lecture. But when we look at uh, other demographics of students, like a lot of students who would study in Dublin would end up working a full-time job to pay for rent to, to attend lectures that they can't actually go to because they're working a full-time job. So, th so this, would, this allows students who are like a, a work a work college balance to actually be able to see the lectures or even commuter students who, um, commuter students who if they missed their bus, if they were commuting from Drogheda and they missed their bus and there wasn't a bus for an hour, they were missing their lecture. So this allowed them to also, I suppose, attend lectures um, given, given their circumstances too. And then also students with disabilities, students who, um, for some reason ha have a bereavement or something it allows the flexibility but they're not missing out on uh, learning give, for, for, for no fault of their own um one thing that however that did come with i suppose the online learning right, was that um like like yeah we as as we move into this this environment of uh, space on campus as you mentioned there there's there's huge there's going to be huge changes to how the university looks in if we're going to combine online learning with recorded um, there are, yeah, there's going to be serious investments in, I suppose, facilitating online learning on campus, while also facilitating that social element and trying to find the balance between the two there. So absolutely, like, um, there, there, there's, there's a lot of challenges that come with this, but really, um, and at the end of the day, students do want to be back on campus. As, as a young person, like, we, we identify with seeing, with seeing new people and having that kind of sense of community that DCU has a really strong sense of community. Um, so we really want to ensure that we keep that with without 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 also um, like removing all the, the great benefits and the eases that uh, co the, the kind of online learning has brought. Well, thanks, uh, Terence. I, I was thinking back to my mad, rather mad hatter activity at the start to ask you to tell me your favorite color, but I'll just remind it that we all have different preferences. And, and I think, you know, that one size fits all, it's a terrible cliche, but this that's very much um, Sharon, what I was hearing in some of your uh, insights and remembering that we're not now just talking about campus-based students who are leaving from school and entering our universities and colleges, that there's a growth of the mature adult part-time learner who are also students with very different kinds of needs and aspirations and commitments. So Elaine, I wonder if I could come to you um, on, on two fronts. One, you're actually not long ago a student, but also from your experience in uh, preparing and developing the digital edge and what we learned from that course. Do you have anything to share? Yeah, definitely. And I think what the, the resounding thing that has come out of the MOOC, and it really echoes what everybody else has mentioned so far, is the importance of the learner voice in this both for identifying issues, but also like identifying and being part of the solution, um, which is what we we really found in the MOOC. So for any of, the, of you who aren't familiar, um, the MOOC um, aimed to uh, help student, third level students adapt to the increased focus on online learning um, because of the pandemic. And one of the unique features of the course was that it was co-designed and co-facilitated by students themselves. So they were part of providing resources and sharing their experience um, in the form of content through uh, voice notes and text-based quotes. So that was, um, they featured prominently throughout the course. Um, but they also were then part of facilitating the course and responding to queries and provoking conversations in the discussion forums throughout the two weeks of the course. And um, they were, really came through as the importance of knowledge sharing and conversations and what you can learn from conversations um, and how people would experience in any form can can share and one of the things I think as well that um, came through was that while universities and staff can make recommendations about the best way to approach something or the different tools to use in many cases the students themselves go way beyond um, and use their own variety of tools and resources 
Um, I know the National Forum conducted a survey in 2020 um, and there was over 600 individual digital tools and resources mentioned by the students um, in that survey. So it just goes to show the wealth of knowledge that's, that's already in the student community that can be shared. And that was one way that the MOOC kind of featured prominently. We also conducted a lot of research um, during the MOOC um, with regards to how students were feeling about the online learning experience. Um, and then by probing further as to the reasons or the sources of those emotions, we actually find kind of a lot of their their perceptions of online learning uh, um, in general. So some of the advantage, their perceived advantages and disadvantages of that type of environment. So I suppose in terms of the emotion, it's unsurprising that over two thirds of the students reported feeling very anxious about moving online. So that was pre the pre course um, survey. And some of the reasons for that were technical issues that they were worried about. They were worried about um, skills um, not having the skills to the digital competences um, to to function in an online environment, their own issues with internet reliability, systems crashing, um, and this really kind of highlights as well the wide spectrum of digital skills um, and, and not only digital skills but other online learning related competencies that exist in the student body and naturally there's a lot of socioeconomic variables that come into play there and as access to higher education broadens we need to be more considerate of that and um, other kind of sources of negative emotions were being worried about their ability to motivate and focus and i think that came up um previously as well and um, they were also worried about group work and um, how they would participate in class. So how, how difficult it might be to um, share your opinion in a forum that moves so fast if, if, if so many people are contributing to it. Um, but on the more positive side, there was also people who felt really excited and hopeful about the experience. And, what, and I think what's shown true and what Terence and Sharon, you've mentioned as well, is reasons for that was flexibility and commute savings that they were going to get from um, from the online environment. Um, but again, lack of socializing was another disadvantage that came through. Um, and it shows the value that, that students place on while they want flexibility, they also want to be able to come together. Um, so there is a bit of a tension there as well, I think. But um, I'm not sure if there was any more specific questions, but we, we really find that students can come to courses, even if they're coming with a perception that they don't know a lot, that they actually can contribute a significant amount and the importance of incorporating conversation and informal conversations into learning resources and how, you know, we can draw on, on different experiences um, in a variety of ways. And I think we can really draw on, you know, open educational resources in particular. Um, in that regard, um, so beyond the MOOC environment, there is definitely the potential to um, get previous students to share reflections and experiences um, via OERs to um, help then incoming students or the next group. Um, that's something I think I've picked up. Well, thanks, Elaine. We, we never have enough time for these conversations. But I know having been involved in that particular project and even down to the level of co-facilitating some of that particular course, uh, I learned a great deal. I realized how, on the one hand, it's very easy to be in the ivory tower and locked in your office talking about online learning. It's not until you've been an online teacher and an online learner yourself that you really have a good insight, I think. And it's one of the challenges I sometimes put to um, people I'm talking with. When was the last time you were an online learner? George, I'm going to come back to you. Karen, I am going to bring you back in because there are implications in all of this for DCU Futures. But George, I wonder what you now will be writing about that was different from what you wrote in your book previously. Uh, that's a that's a great question, Mark. Thanks for that. Um, there's a couple of areas I think that are incredibly important at this point in time that have been already mentioned. Actually, I'd like to highlight them. Um, 
So the first is the point about flexibility. Um, we flexibility was mentioned in the literature prior and um, and was examined, you know, with the lens of usually adult learners, you know, not being able to attend an institution, um, sort of a physical institution close to their um, to where they live, but. We've seen how important flexibility is for every single student and how it can accommodate their lives and how um, how sort of supportive that feels, right? So the idea of the institution being the center and sort of the feature that we have to gather ourselves around is a bit our take. I think modern institutions center themselves on the learners and uh, try and explore ways to um, essentially serve their learners. Uh, and I think flexibility is where, uh, where that comes in. Um, the second part was assessment, uh, exactly what Sharon was talking about and exactly how we need to figure out uh, assessment to not only be um, authentic, but also supportive and accommodating of students and their learning. Um, there's much debate these days around um, our remote proctoring tools. I think some of the implications of that and issues around ethical technology are important to reflect on. And then finally, one point that's become very clear to me is this idea of um, so it's very hard to take the pandemic out of remote learning. So what we're learning at this point in time is not just about learning, but it's also about you know people being in a pandemic and dealing with teaching and learning um, in the context of you know the anxieties and concerns that they have. So concerns that we have about remote learning at this point in time, or um, you know the successes that we see, um, are difficult to separate from you know the way that we are currently living our lives, and I think that makes complicated a bit the conversation about you know what's been problematic about remote slash online learning at this point in time, and what uh, what are the lessons that we can um, that we can take forward. I think the lessons that we can take forward uh, are much more clearer than sort of the difficulties that people have been facing with remote learning during the pandemic. Um, yeah, I'll pause there for now. I hope that's helpful. And, and I was just trying to post a few links to some of your pieces on this very topic, but feel free because I think you've got a, an article that's either in pre-print or it may have come out uh, and not everyone will be able to access um, the journal Distance Education, the Odler Journal. Kieran, I, I can't help but and I have an eye on the time, so I think we're going to kind of wrap up in the next three or four minutes. I'm only going to give you a short bite at the end here just mindful that I don't want to commit anyone past um, five o'clock, essentially. Uh, so DCU Futures has made a commitment to online education or online learning is woven into the course experience. Some of you in this meeting, a handful will know that we had a meeting just before uh, this webinar where a number of DCU's heads and deans were discussing the future of teaching and learning. I posted a comment in the chat box that online and offline must not be seen as mutually exclusive. Um, and Sharon, I think your point about spaces emphasizes this for me, that the opportunity for students to gather around the monitor and watch a pre-recorded lecture or a mini lecture and discuss it is a kind of hybridity that um, I would like to see our spaces support, or they could do that virtually as well. So, Karen, the short uh, question for you probably needs a much longer answer, but is what are the implications for DCU futures and, and how you're going to have to plan differently before the application was prepared and now the world we face? Um, yeah, so for like, as I said, when the application was prepared, the kind of the, the, the proposal that 15% of students' experience of the online learning seemed, you know, to be quite. Uh, quite progressive or quite different or quite novel, but now, obviously, as I said, that's that's no longer the case. I think, you know, what, what struck me over the last number of months um, 
is that, you know, his start, like I, it's, as I said, my, I come from various different disciplines and one of them is intercultural studies. And we talk a lot about cross-cultural adaptation, Mark, and you probably experienced cross-cultural adaptation moving, you know, physically relocating uh, over to Ireland, for example. But essentially, I would always have seen this shift from secondary education to higher education as a form of cross-cultural adaptation. And so far as students are migrating from one culture, and what I mean by culture is a set of values that are shared by a group of people that are reflected in their behaviors, their norms, their systems, and their structures and their outputs. And so secondary education has a certain culture, what they value, they value the consumption of vast quantities of information and the reproduction of it without kind of cogitating it too much you know, reflecting or critically upon it. And then you come into higher education, there's a fundamentally different value system. So we say, you know, like you can't just take someone else's ideas and use them as your own. And so there is a body of work that needs to be done around cross-cultural adaptation anyway. And I think now when we have the shift towards online, it's, a, it's an extension of that. So we need to understand, that, okay, now students are now, this is a new form of cross-cultural adaptation. You're not just you know, migrating into higher education, you're also migrating into a digital world as well. And it's all well and good for universities to say, we can offer things online and we can, we can offer, there's, as in there's affordances out there for students, but we need to be very mindful that the students themselves have the competencies to be able to identify and leverage those affordances. So it's a maximized potential that, that online offers them. And that's something that's really struck me in the last month, particularly where we talk about we're going to do X, Y and Z. And then different people have said to us, particularly on accreditation panels, external specialists have said, that's great. But like, how are you actually preparing your students so they can actually, you know, really tap in and maximize the potential of this? Um, and so what Elaine was talking about there, I think, is very important that we need to do a lot of work around not just prep, prepping our, our colleagues as staff, because as I said, it's, it is a cultural shift in DCU away from the sage and the stage. Um, but how can we prep the students as well so they can make the most of the opportunities that are there? But I'll stop talking now because it's five o'clock. Well, thanks everyone. Um, I'm gonna take the privilege as moderator to have the final word here, apart from thanking each of you individually and collectively for what I think has been a, a really fascinating and insightful discussion we could continue for some time. And I guess we will do so for probably years to come. Um, I like metaphors in thinking about things to try to get us to think differently. This is not an original metaphor. Some of you may have heard about it, but it's about the spaces for learning. And the spaces for learning don't necessarily have to be physical or virtual. It comes um, from a, a piece some years ago, designing around the spaces of caves, campfires, watering holes, and mountaintops. The cave is the place to learn by yourself. Sometimes you just have to have your own space to reflect, to deep think. The watering hole is where you go and meet people. It's the equivalent of the water cooler, the cafe as such. The campfire is where you get around and tell stories and you listen to those old wise timers, um, old in a, inverted commas, but have knowledge that they can share, but through storytelling, through a different kind of pedagogy, if you like. And then the campfire, sorry, the mountaintop picks up on that issue about assessment. Assessment being something that's challenging to climb to the mountaintop, but something that's not only challenging, you celebrate when you get there. You're not ashamed and you're joyous to delight in your um, celebration of achieving such a goal. So for me, those are metaphors when I think about learning design and the hybridity between blended or um, online and offline. And I hope everyone has found the conversation um, valuable. We've kept a good number of people right through to now past 5 p.m. here in Dublin for George's benefit. He has a full day ahead of himself so uh, and ha already having had a bike ride. So he's probably wired to be uh, on to the next gig as such. But for the rest of us who are closing down our day, and Terence in particular, I thank you for you because you got like about 30 minutes notice of joining the panel, but your contribution was very valuable to triangulate and support Sharon's particularly insightful and very fresh Irish um, data. So on that note, I'm gonna call it a wrap and have a good evening, everyone, and don't answer emails for too late into the night. Cheers. 
Thanks very much, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Take care. Everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, George. Thank you. Thank you.